Hello and welcome to Midlands at Home. On today's show we'll be talking about stamp duty and the benefits of the new legislation which of course came into effect the end of last year. Plus discussing first time buyers as a recent newspaper article quoted astonishingly that first time buyers need at least £29,000 to get their foot on the property ladder. Our guest today is Ashley Gray from Paul Carr Estate Agents. Ashley, welcome to Big Centre. Thank you for joining us. Rebecca, it's very nice to be here. Thank you. <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit about your background in the property industry. Uh, well, I've been in the estate agency business for probably more years than I can remember. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, totting up 28 years now. And uh, I'm a director of Paul Carr Estate Agents, and my primary role is... Uh, I'm the business development director. Okay. So. And what's your patch? What area do you cover? Well, our, our, our business covers the north of the West Midlands Conurbation, so that's North Birmingham, the whole of Sutton Coalfield, uh, Aldridge, Warsaw, and uh, parts of South Staffordshire as well. Brilliant. And you do, um, we were looking a bit, a bit earlier on at these vendor videos, which I think mm. is a fantastic way to advertise a property. So we're going to take a little look now, actually. This is a beautiful property. What's the name of the property? Uh, Crook Barn. Crook Barn, very nice name. And it's in Dostill, uh, that's near Tamworth. So take a little look at this. Crook Barn is a Grade two listed conversion dating back to the 16th century. Set within a small hamlet of nine similar style properties on an exclusive gated complex. This barn has been sympathetically rebuilt and modernised to a high specification by the current owners. With exposed original treated beams, this property offers immense character and charm. The stylish contemporary interior offers a pleasant setting for the family to relax, with two double bedrooms on the ground floor, one of which has an ensuite. And there is a main bathroom and a further double bedroom to the mezzanine floor. The spacious open-plan lounge dining room has a large inglenook fireplace and double doors with decorative glazed panels, which opens to a large breakfast kitchen. Outside the property, there are two allocated parking spaces and a further carport to cater for a third car. There are seating areas at the sides of the property, while there is also a landscaped gravel courtyard to the front with feature lighting. Crock Barn was once a well-known dance hall within Dost Hill and is one of the oldest buildings in Dost Hill alongside the Norman Chapel. The countryside to the west is known as the Round Hills, a series of slopes down to the River Tame, ideal for rambling and tobogganing. The views from the highest point are magnificent and the water meadows within the valley are extensive. Beautiful property, you could literally move straight in, so gorgeous, I love it. I love the blend of the old with the new. Tell us a little bit about the history, because this is a, a really old property as well, isn't it? Well, it's uh, as it's one of the oldest properties in uh, in Dostal. Um, uh, it's been a barn for the majority of its 400 years of life. Yeah. Um, and it was a, a local dance hall, so we understand. I know, that's what we just heard. It's brilliant. It's, I love the back school like it's, history. It's amazing. I'm assuming they had a barn dance in <laughs> yeah, there, which is you what they would have that, had. Absolutely, you? <laughs> couldn't you? With the straw bales and, yes. and what have you. Um, but uh, in 1992, the current owners... Uh, took it over and they've renovated it to what you see today. Yeah, it's gorgeous. And how much is that on the market for? Um, it's a smidgen under £500,000. Wow, it's absolutely beautiful. So, uh, is that something you do with a lot of your properties, these vendor videos? Um, the vast majority of our properties have vendor videos. It's been something we've been doing for um, around about two years. It's unique to us. Um, and it's just another way of making us as a company different from everybody else. Same. And the vast majority of our vendors absolutely think it's wonderful. Um, it gives a different perspective. It's a little bit different to reading uh, a set of sales brochures. Yes. Um, you can sit and you can actually listen to somebody narrate about the property and tell them all about it. Then they've got the basic information as a, uh, in paper form as well, or they can look at it on the internet. So it is, yeah. a, it is a new innovation to us and uh, very successful. Well, great you listed. So was there a way that they got around? Because obviously it looks lovely and fresh and new, and they've obviously done a lot of alterations. Mm -hmm. How did the current owners achieve that? Well, the, the situation with this type of property when it's grade two listed is that you need to be very careful. There are certain things you can do and certain things you can't do. Um, what the, the current owners did, which I think is to their credit, is before they started work, they actually approached the local Tamworth Council mm. and they also approached English Heritage as well and asked for their advice. And all the way through the project, they were telling me that they worked hand in hand, they were certain things they could do, certain things they couldn't do, and the finished article is a result of cooperation between all three. 
I think the mistake that people make going into this sort of property is that they want have an idea that yeah. they want and that's not negotiable and unfortunately that's when people start to get into trouble with uh, with the authorities I'm yes, afraid. Yes, what a great idea. Mm. And now we are talking about first time buyers. Take a look at this. It was in the Birmingham Mail on Saturday the 4th of May uh, that West Midlands first time buyers need at least £29,000 to get on the property ladder. Uh, I just think that's incredible. What a large amount of money! It's, I mean, it's only. Well, I, I think I think the article is talking about uh, about about incomes as opposed mm. to d deposits, but. I think what we need to consider as well is that, um, yes, if you're buying a property on your own, then yeah. yes, that's the sort of income you need. But remember, an awful lot of property buy uh, as two people. It could be a couple or a married couple or yeah. a partnership or whatever it may be. So therefore, that amount of money is within an awful lot of uh, people's reaches. I think the issue with a lot of people is not the affordability, right. it's the deposit. Yes, because it says actually that the average worker falls more than £8,000 short. Mm, mm, mm. Um, yes, I, I, I think that's right, but I, I also feel as well that um, looking at the affordability of property, um, when people are having to save up for a 10% deposit and thinking mm. that the average house price is not too far short of £200,000 these yeah. days, um, then that's an awful lot of money. But there are affordable properties around if people just take the time to have a look. I think it's people's aspirations sometimes are a little bit higher than what their pockets can actually stand. That's it, I suppose, if we all kind of hold... But we all want the fancy holidays, the nice cars, mm. different generation, I suppose, coming mm. through now. I think, uh, you know, in, in, in sort of my generation, when I bought, bought my first house, which is... Craig, he's close to some 40 years ago now. Um, things were different. Uh, it was one of the first things that you ever did. Yeah. Um, first time buyers were in their early to mid 20s. Now we're talking about first time buyers being, you know, in their sometimes 30s and late 30s. So therefore, they've already established a lifestyle before they go into the property buying, uh, uh, buying market. And that is sometimes their problem because they they have a lifestyle they have friends they have family they have holidays mm -hmm. they have cars they have all sorts we want of things it all, don't and, we? They, and, yeah. and yes i think they want it all and you know i i, I what frustrates me a little bit is people saying i can't afford to save up yeah um i think that if people then looked seriously at what they do spend their money on um and in today's market all the lenders want is they will ask everybody to do a budget plan yeah and certainly some of the financial advisors who work for, for us, um, it's a real eye-opener for people sitting in front of them when they actually sit down and put on paper what they've yeah. actually spent their money on. And certainly looking at that, it is uh, far more affordable. And the lower end of the market, there are plenty of properties around in the Midlands for people to choose from. And there's lots of schemes now. The government with the new help to buy and talk of the IC. There's a lot. I think the government is certainly helping a lot as well with first-time buyers. I, I, th I think they are. And uh, it's uh, what people need to do is that if they're thinking about pro buying a property, they need to do some planning. Yes. And they need to start. The first thing they don't need to do is to go out and start and look for a property. They need to make sure they've got their finances in place. Um, mortgages are geared up now to the individual. So you might have friends or you might have family that got a mortgage that doesn't guarantee that you will get the same deal from right. the same lender. And that's very, very important. And what I would say to people is that if you are going to take some financial advice is to make sure that the people you talk to are what are called whole of market advisors. Okay. Not everybody is. Um, you may go to, uh, to, to certain companies, ask the question, are you whole of market? Right. Because there are many people who are giving advice who maybe only have five or six lenders to choose from rather than every single lender that's available to them yeah and deposits I think that's a I suppose if you know we want everything in the holidays if we maybe I remember my parents saying back in the day they used to have a stew that would last them two or three days you know they would really make their money yeah, stretch yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think it's about um, you know people being motivated to, mm. to deal with it and I think that if people put their mind to it they can do everything yeah, I think course. if they need to sit down and, and, and have a talk about it but you know as you mentioned some of the government schemes where people now only need a five percent deposit with some of the government schemes that are there to help 
have brilliant. to buy, mm. which is which is fantastic. Um, obviously, if you're not going to go with a government scheme, then realistically, the minimum you're going to need is 10%, but the more you can put down, the cheaper it becomes these days. Yeah, and new homes, they've got a lot of incentives with new homes as well. So. Well, the, the, the help to buy scheme for new homes is, um, is, is, is what's called an equity scheme. And how that works is effectively the government are lending you part of your deposit. So you would pl put down 5% of your of your deposit yourself, the government will actually lend you 20%. So if, in effect, you've got a 25% deposit. Yeah. It's for new homes only, uh, not for homes that are already pre-built. Um, and it's a, a scheme that is also helping to drive the house building market as well. So it's having a, a knock-on effect in two ways. One, it's getting people on the housing ladder, and it's also helping uh, the building companies to uh, to build more properties because yeah. they're getting more buyers for them. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're, we're going to be talking more after the break yep. and also about stamp duty as well. Absolutely. So don't go anywhere. Maybe grab yourselves a cup of tea, and we look forward to seeing you in just a few minutes. See you next time. Welcome back. Now, at the end of last year, there was a huge change to stamp duty. George Osborne said that 98% of homeowners in England and Wales would pay less after the changes were made in December of last year to what they had previously known with the old system. Only people who buy homes worth more than 937,000 will pay more in tax now. Mr Osborne told the MPs, it's time we change this badly designed tax on aspiration. So, Ashley, do you think these changes are more positive? Well, I think if they, the the vast majority of people are are actually benefiting from it, mm. um, obviously the 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 other situation that we find with the stamp duty is that um, it's evened out the tax system, because. Um, the thresholds that were there before, if you paid a penny more for your property, then you paid the full amount of stamp duty. It's now a graduated tax. Yes. So, um, Far fairer, isn't it? It's, it's a lot fairer for people who are paying the tax, and it's also an awful lot fairer for people who are selling property, because um, when the previous changes came in some many, many years ago, um, the, there became glass ceilings. Yeah. So, for example, all properties up to 125,000 were exempt from stamp duty. They still yeah. are. But it did mean that people whose properties were worth just slightly more than that were finding them very difficult to sell at the figures that they were really worth um, because people did not want to pay the tax on principle. Yes. The same happened at £250,000 mm. when there was a big jump. But now we've levelled the playing field a little bit. Those people who've got properties that are worth between one hundred and twenty-five and one hundred and thirty thousand pounds, and maybe between two hundred and fifty and two hundred and seventy thousand yeah. pounds, are going to get full value for their property now and get the full market price. So these glass ceilings have disappeared. Yeah, I think that's a fair point because if your house was, you know, sort of before it was worth say two hundred eighty thousand, the estate agents would say, ah, but you've got the two hundred and fifty thousand tax duty, so actually we're going to have to market it at this, and it mm. did have a huge effect, didn't it, on what your house was? Well, well it, it did. It did. It, it meant that there was a concertina of prices and prices were being held down some people would say that was a good thing to, yeah. to hold prices down but you know we are, are in a free market economy and you know the value of your house is what someone's prepared to pay for it and now okay. stamp duty is not in the equation uh, in terms of thresholds, then it just makes properties a little bit easier to sell at their full market value. Yeah, we were talking savings. There's an article on the BBC website. Take a little look at this. So what you could be saving. Ashley, talk us a little bit through um, the savings that we're generally seeing from the new legislation. Well, well, basically, at the lower end of the markets, then between 125 and, and 250,000 uh, pounds, the savings that uh, that people can make are uh, roughly in the region of 650,000 pounds plus. The biggest savings come in the two hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand pounds bracket, when the maximum savings we can have are around about four and a half thousand um, pounds. But obviously, for those people who have the highest aspirations um, and want to buy a property in excess of, I think it's nine hundred and thirty-seven thousand and five hundred pounds, I'm afraid as you go above that, then it gets greater and greater and greater. Mm -hmm. And for those uh, people who may be looking at their lottery numbers on Saturday and thinking what sort of property <laughs> yes, number they can have. If they're looking to buy anything in excess of £2 million, I'm afraid they're going to pay another £18,750 in stamp duty. Um, but as an awful lot of people would say, if they can afford to buy the house at that level, true. maybe they can afford to pay the stamp duty as well. Very I'm true. not sure that's strictly true. <laughs> £18,000 will buy you an average family car. Oh, well, absolutely. But generally, I suppose, sort of from um, up to 900000 we are seeing 
big savings when it comes to stamp duty on properties? Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, the savings vary. And again, you know, I would have a quick check. Um, if you look at uh, the government's website, it will tell you you can put in a website calculator. You can put in the actual value of the property you're purchasing and it'll tell you exactly how much stamp duty yeah. you work. You don't have to have a degree in maths to work this yeah. out. Um, it does appear complicated, but as I said, the government on their website, just have a look. Put in the figures that you're looking at yeah. and they'll tell you exactly how much you've got. And that's fantastic, isn't it? Because, you know, sort of uh, my parents, when they were buying property, they never had any of that. So I think it's brilliant nowadays how much help there is when it comes to moving house. I, I think there's an awful lot of help. There's an awful lot of advice out there. Mm. I think that um, you need to go to something that's regulated, so a government website. I think you need to go and ask a professional for advice. Um, I think that the days of asking the man down the pub for advice have long gone now. <laughs> Yeah, very true. I had a friend actually that had messaged me and she was moving house. This was, um, I think she, she must have sorted everything out in November. And then this new legislation came out, had a little text saying, I've saved three and a half thousand pound on stamp duty, you know, because the new legislation means that generally most people are saving, not hundreds, but thousands. So I think well, it's well, my, positive. Well, my, my daughter bought a property uh, a few weeks ago. Um, had she bought it under the old stamp duty threshold, mm. she'd have paid 1,500 pounds stamp duty under the new rule she's paid £500 so it saved her £1,000. Fantastic £1, isn't it? Yeah and we, we I think when it comes to moving you think goodness me so many costs you've got stamp duty you've got your legals talk us a little bit through the process of moving. Well basically again it's all about preparation I said it in the first mm, part of the show yeah. that people need to sit down and prepare they need to do a budget you need to have a budget of the costs and the costs effectively come in two forms um, if you're moving house and uh, you're a first-time buyer, then obviously the costs are stacked against the purchase. So we're talking about your legal costs. You're talking about how yeah. much your solicitor will charge you for his fee. But you're also talking about the ancillary costs that go with that. We're talking about um, things like um, land registry charges yes. and so on and so forth. Make sure that you get a full quote from your solicitor and so on because it's important that you have that budget. It's not just to say how much is your fee. Yeah. The fees may look very reasonable when you start adding the things on, they become more expensive. The other thing that you need to look at is uh, the costs associated with your mortgage because uh, certain deals will come with certain costs. And again, if you're dealing with an independent mortgage broker, a whole of market uh, mortgage advice yes. service, then they will be able to explain to you and compare lender to lender. The one thing I would be very, very careful about doing uh, is going onto one of these comparable websites mm. to do mortgages because they don't know anything about you. Yeah. They were giving you figures that can mislead you totally. Um, it's better to get independent advice and to make sure you've got all the figures uh, down. If you're looking to move house and use a removal company, yeah. then again, that needs to be brought into, into play. Um, if you're buying and selling, mm -hmm. then obviously the costs will be higher because you've got obviously estate agent's fees to have a look at. You've also got the solicitor's costs for the yeah. sale of your property as well as the purchase of the other. And, you know, it is far better to sit there, write it all down, make sure you've got all the, uh, the, the facts and figures before you start so you're not going to get any nasty shocks yeah, at the end. Yeah, absolutely. So preparation and I suppose shopping around as well. Don't be afraid to ring and get several quotes on mm. your solicitors because they really do vary. Um, th they do. I think what people have to be careful about is that um, it's the actual charge the solicitor makes which will vary. The actual other costs are set in stone so the land registry yeah, fees will be the set. same. Mm. Um, it's uh, The local searches may vary depending on where you are in the local authority for example. So if you're buying a property in Birmingham them, then they may be slightly different from if you're buying a property in Worcestershire and so on and so forth. But these variances are very, very small. But I would also think, I, I, I'm, I'm slightly old fashioned. I look at um, value for money, not necessarily the cheapest. Because yes, at the end of the day, if people are offering cheap services, then they're, they're cutting corners somewhere. It may be that you've got uh, a solicitor who's internet based. Well, that's fine for those people who are au fait with that. But, you know, the little old lady down the road <laughs> is not going to be looking at a solicitor and by text and by email. Yeah. She probably wants to go and see the solicitor and shake his hand and look him in the eye. And again, it's horses for courses. Deal with firms that are specifically doing conveyancing as their main job. Um, some solicitors do conveyancing, but their main job may be court work. 
it may be that that's an add-on for them. So make sure that you're getting a solicitor who is main job is doing conveyancing and uh, you're not going to go far wrong. No, that's it. and it's a tricky process. I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of people with the nice weather, mm -hmm. um, more properties selling, more properties coming onto the market. Mm -hmm. And so I've got to ask actually, my friend the other day, she was moving and um, the people that were buying her house uh, expected all the carpets that were going to be left. Uh, I know back in the day you used to take up your carpets. Mm -hmm. What do people tend to do with sort of things like carpets? Do they take them with them now? Well, very rarely, to be honest. You may see on agents' particulars uh, carpets and, cu and curtains mm. and the range cooker and light fittings yeah. by separate negotiation. I think what it means effectively is that uh, that becomes part of the negotiation of the sale price. But uh, the vast majority of people, carpets don't fit anywhere else. No. They're sitting there. Um, curtains, well, yes, you could take oh, those right, elsewhere. Yeah. Light fittings, remember there is a point of law about light fittings. If you remove a light fitting because, you know, your Auntie Mavis bought it for yes. you and uh, it's of sentimental value, you must replace place it with a working yeah, ceiling rose. Yeah, same bushes garden. Yeah. Absolutely, but uh, the best thing to be able to do is to, is when you're selling your property, is to decide at the beginning what is going to be included in the price and what yeah. is not going to be included in the price. Make sure that your agent is fully aware of that because then he can advise the buyers and so on and so forth because uh, the world's worst thing can happen is that somebody is buying a property and they think they're getting certain items and when it comes to the death, they're not, and that just upsets people. It does, and I think it, yeah. being transparent, being a little bit open about it, I think at the beginning uh, is is all part and parcel. But you know, negotiating the sale is important. Your agent, his job is to get you the best price, and yeah. you know, I, 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 we have advice to our clients: is please do not ne try and negotiate the sale. In, in the property. I had I that one, so the guy yeah. actually said, oh, well, between you yeah. and me, let's see if we can sort some sort of deal. And I kind of stood on the spot of that, oh, goodness me, my agent wasn't there because they couldn't turn up for the appointment. And I had to stand there in the kitchen and, mm. and try and talk figures. It was I, a little I, bit awkward. I, I think the interesting thing about that is, is that um, in many cases, people will try and do some negotiations with you because they don't want the agent to ask them the hard questions. Yeah, that's it. You know, Always it's, interesting. It's, a, it's a situation where we can find out all about their financial circumstances mm. and advise you accordingly. Absolutely. Well, thank you for joining us today. Not a uh, you take care and I'll see you next time on Midlands at Home.